Um, participants, thank you for joining us for our panel today as one of the uh, many events scheduled for Greenlee's First Amendment Days. Uh, thank you to the Greenlee First Amendment Committee for organizing all these wonderful events. Uh, and um, if you haven't seen, you can check the schedule on the Greenlee website. There's a lot more great stuff going on throughout the week. Um, I'm Kelly Winfrey. I'm an assistant professor in the jur of journalism and chair of the Greenlee Schools Diversity Committee. And our diversity committee is co-sponsoring this panel. This panel. Um, before we get started, I think it's important, particularly given our topic with this panel, uh, to acknowledge the history of the land on which we host these events uh, virtually and uh, physically um, by reading the university's land acknowledgement statement. Iowa State University aspires to be the best land grant university at creating a welcoming and inclusive environment where diverse individuals can succeed and thrive. As a land grant institution, we are committed to the caretaking of this land and would like to begin this event by acknowledging those who have previously taken care of the land on which we gather. Before this site became Iowa State University, it was the ancestral lands and territory of the Bakoje or Iowa Nation. The United States obtained the land from the Meskwasi and Sauk Nations in the Treaty of 1842, and we wish to recognize our obligations to this land and the people who took care of it, as well as to the 17,000 Native people who live in Iowa today. Um, today's panel is going to focus on, of course, the First Amendment, but as it relates to student activism and campus climate. Uh, to give some context and, and kind of frame our discussion, I want to just kind of remind everyone what the First Amendment says. And if you've attended Greenlee events, you've probably been reminded already quite a bit. Um, but Congress shall make no law establish, excuse me, no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the pe people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And so as we use that to frame our discussion today, there's a lot of parts to that that are relevant to uh, student activism and the work that our panelists are doing today. And what I'd like to do is have each person introduce yourself, um, tell us what organization you're affiliated with and kind of what the First Amendment means to you. And I'll just kind of call on you by first name and you can give us, you know, give us a little bit about yourself and um, what the, why the First Amendment is important. Uh, Drew, we'll start with you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dhruv uh, Rituri, and I use he, him, his pronouns. And I hope you can hear me through the mask. I have a shared office space. And uh, so I'm a graduate student. I study engineering. And the organization today that I'm, I'm here to represent is Students Against Racism. Um, I've been working with uh, that organization for coming up to two years now. And um, I'm happy to talk more about that work. Um, and so the, the, regarding the First Amendment, I would say that it, it has uh, a lot of connotations for uh, people of color, especially at this university. So um, I really appreciate us uh, taking the time to um, really understand its intricacies uh, because um, it does have this reductionist appeal as well um, where it, it, it can be seem to be very black and white. And I hope today we can sort of understand that there's a lot of gray in the middle. Thank you, Drew. Um, Alejandra, would you go ahead and go next? Hi, uh, I'm Alejandra Flores. I am the president of the International Student Council. And I would say the First Amendment, kind of to echo the same thing that Devru said, um, it is an amendment that protects, you know, the right to the fr freedom in general. Uh, but there's a lot of gray area, and it's definitely, a f I would say, is a, a topic of discussion for marginalized communities. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, Logan, I'll have you go next. Hi all, uh, my name is Logan Metzger, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I am uh, <clears throat> currently the managing editor of content, as well as a columnist and a member of the editorial board at the Iowa State Daily. Um, the First Amendment means to me a um, wide variety of different things. It's uh, mainly the reason I have my job and ability to do th the things that I do at the newspaper, but it's um, mainly a chance to speak, a chance to speak out, say things, talk about issues that could easily be ignored um, or shoved down if we didn't have the First Amendment. 
So that's um, kind of my take on that. Thank you, Logan. Uh, Mia, I'll have you go next. Hi, my name is Mia. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I'm actually a freshman and I'm representing um, International Student Council as well um, today. And for me, the First Amendment, I would just like to echo what everyone else has said so far um, about what the First Amendment is to them. Um, as someone in a marginalized community, I think um, personally, the First Amendment is just allows me to have a voice to talk about and bring awareness to all the issues that um, my community as well as other marginalized communities face, um, as well as like the gray area that everyone has said so far about um, both the damaging effects that um, free speech could have on us as well. Thank you, Mia. Um, Sheila, would you go ahead and go next? Uh, my name is Sheila and I am a freshman at Iowa State. I, the organization that I am representing today is Monsoon Asian Pacific Islanders in Solarity. To me, the First Amendment is very important for underserved um, communities or communities on the margin and people of color who have historically not been able to have a voice. It also allows people to say what they want and, um, and raise awareness of different movements and express injustices that society might see. And currently, I believe it is an important time to exercise and uphold the First Amendment because of all the threats and civil rights, uh, threats against civil and human rights have been occurring. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Ellie, we'll have you go next. Hi, everyone. My name is Ellie. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the entomology department, and I'm also the president of the Graduate and Professional Student Senate in my second term. So I'm here representing the GPSS. The First Amendment is important for me because it lets me use my platform as a student leader to discuss movements and voices that otherwise may not have been moved to such a central position. And I'm also involved in a lot of discussions about campus climate. So I'm aware that the First Amendment can be a huge barrier because it protects hate speech. And that's something that we're probably gonna be talking a lot about today. Thank you, Ellie. Um, and Imran, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? All right. Um... Hi, my name is Imran Mazri, and I'm currently a senior in management information systems that is under the College of Business. Um, I am an international student from Malaysia, but um, currently I'm not affiliated with any student organization. Um, I was in the International Student Council, just like Alejandro and Mia is right now. I was also in the Malaysian Student Association, but right now I'm just a normal international student. Uh, I guess I, I'm very humbled to be here, even though I, I'm not affiliated with any student organization, because I think international students, even though they do not join any student organization, they still have a lot of opinions to say about the things that are going on in campus and also in the country as well. And I think um, going back to the First Amendment, what does the First Amendment mean to me is that I think it, it, reaches, it reached to a point that it places too much burden on us as students to understand and also follow whatever it is um, it means um, so much so that it places our activism below whatever it is that we're trying to follow on the First Amendment, right? So I guess going back to the history of this country, um, I want to point out as well, especially during the 1950s, 1960s, we have a lot of issues where, for example, during the McCarthyism era, we had, you know, the Congress had um, the House of Un-American Committees, which is, I think, it, uh, if we took a look at in the First Amendment, principles, I think that goes against the First Amendment rights. So, um, and it goes on year after year, I think during the 1960s, during the Vietnam War, we also had the, the famous student activist movement, the free speech movement, the FSM led by Mario Savio, right? Mario Savio was fighting for the First Amendment, but at the same time, we know that he was surveilled by the FBI under the COINTELPRO. So I guess, again, a violation of the First Amendment rights. And I think, um, again, um, even though of uh, this year, post 9-11, we also had the Patriot Act and also the stop and frisk policy, again, that infringes the First Amendment right of the people. And I think, again, going back to the idea of the First Amendment is that we, we always try to focus too much on that idea, even though we are living under the institution in, in which it always has been infringes our rights as normal citizens. So I think that is why I think um, our discussion should be held right now today when it comes to the First Amendment rights. Thank you, Imran. I, th I think that you uh, made some great points there too uh, of kind of where this conversation um, can go and the complexity around talking about the First Amendment and in particular free speech on a campus 
um, that there's good and bad and a lot of gray area. And of course, if this was all um, simple, we wouldn't need to still have court cases and um, you know challenges uh, uh, about what it should mean and what should or shouldn't be protected. So um, I'd like to kind of apply some of this and focus particularly um, on the activism that some of you have been involved in. And so I wanna focus on, for, for this part, the, the different groups that are represented here. And I'd like to have you tell us a little bit about your organization um, and how you've engaged in activism to improve the climate at Iowa State uh, and what kind of First Amendment protection, speech, assembly, petition, the press have been important for you to do this work. So I think I'll go ahead and start um, with Logan. Um, Iowa State Daily is, a, is probably the most direct and clear example of the First Amendment. Um, and we'll, we'll get started with you. So yeah, um, as Kelly just said, uh, the Iowa State Daily, we are the student newspaper on campus. We have been since 1890. Um, and um, yeah, we basically represent the First Amendment protection of uh, press, but also speech kind of mixed in there together. Um, we cover everything from, you know, sports and fashion and different things like that. But we also cover important um, issues around diversity, equity, inclusion here at Iowa State. Um, and discussions around that protests, activism, different things that um, we've probably have written about the different groups that are represented here besides ourselves and talked about their issues and things like that. Um, because saying those things and making sure those are out there in the world is important because without the news, without us saying that things are happening, people might not know that they're not happening. So it's that's important and getting it out there. Um, I uh, personally have been on both sides of the newspaper. I have done the hard news. I was a diversity editor, a reporter my freshman year, and then I was diversity editor last year um, covering these important issues. And then um, this year I've taken more on, uh, taken more <clears throat> on the role of the opinion side and discussing um, things like um, hate speech here on campus with my columns and working with the editorial board to speak up on issues that we think are important, such as gun laws and things like that here in Iowa itself. Um, I think, yeah, that's pretty much sums up what the Iowa State Daily does. But if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat and I'll try to answer them. Thank you, Logan. And Logan's um, written some great pieces. There was one recently uh, that I think uh, kind of led to your participation in some of the First Amendment Day panel. Uh, the price of my life is $4,021. Uh, and I think that's a great piece if you haven't read it. And, and the work that Logan has done in the Daily has done to um, amplify voices on campus and give a place for people to be heard, I think is very important. Um, and, and it really makes the daily uh, an important part of our campus and, and, and different than some other institutions as well. Um, Drew, could you talk a little bit about Students Against Racism? Yes, so our organization doesn't have uh, a long history, but I think it sort of um, continues on the tradition of just uh, a, a swell of, of support that people uh, have for marginalized communities when incidents of overt racism occur on campus. And so one of those incidents that occurred led to the creation of this edition of uh, this continuation of, of, uh, of uh, um, you know, organizing. And so Students Against Racism has a, a history that's really split into the pre-COVID and the post-COVID era. In the pre-COVID era, we were very much about assembly. And I think we were able to create spaces where we were able to ask questions to people in power. And I think that in um, a lot of the conversations that occur, uh, I, I think that the information seems to flow from top to bottom and there aren't many opportunities to ask questions and get clarification. And I think that the fact that we were able to ask difficult questions and even uh, when we weren't able to receive clear answers, I think even that was quite powerful. Uh, and so creating those spaces was and those opportunities to ask questions to people, to people in positions of power was extremely important in the pre-COVID era. And in the post-COVID era, uh, we are sort of working over Zoom. And uh, so we're not um, calling for people to protest. And um, 
in in that space, it's uh, it's been hard for us to recruit people. Uh, but one one activity that we've continued to do is uh, the university has been uh, working with us to create a, a diversity and inclusion um, council, which is not going to prevent incidents of racism in the sense that we were not going to investigate and find people responsible and and give them uh, punishments, but this council is meant to reduce harm because even if the First Amendment protects uh, people that may uh, write things that I consider hate speech, uh, there, are, there is still harm being done. And I think there is something we can do as a community to reduce that harm. Um, and so I'd be happy to give more details about that. But in the post COVID era, Students Against Racism has sort of, that's become our, our central aim and uh, we will be making applications uh, available to the, to the student body and everybody is encouraged to apply in the fall. And we're hoping to get that off the ground very shortly. Thank you, Dhruv. I, I think um, uh, one thing I wanna mention as we are thinking about this and what, what Dhruv was talking about uh, in some ways, you know, working with the institution, petitioning the institution for change is an important part of the first amendment as well. Um, and remember that Iowa State University is a public institution, therefore it kind of falls under the government um, and, and not being able to infringe on free speech rights. But I think we can have some good conversations about how, like Drew said, we mitigate harm um, and work within what we have, um, the options that we have. So um, Alejandra, I'm gonna turn to you to talk a little bit about International Students Council. Yeah, hi. So um, brief description before I go into what we do. Um, so the International Student Council is a council on campus that aims to help serve, improve the lives of international and multicultural students. Um, we do this through outreach, collaborative events, um, and the celebration of culture on campus. So how we've engaged in activism differs year to year as our executive team changes, but this year, we have had multiple projects to combat uh, different issues such as COVID isolation. We've done projects to raise awareness for world hunger. Uh, we also participate with various groups and multicultural organizations on campus to give them the platform to speak on topics such as uh, this year has been, you know, Asian hate crime, Black Lives Matter, um, which we will actually have an outreach event for on Friday. So that's exciting. Um, we continuously advocate for our students to understand um, climate on campus and bring those issues to different parts of the university and aims by working with administration, student government, police, etc. Um, also, we are beginning a brand new open forum for minority communities on campus so students can have a place to talk about issues with members of their own community. Uh, this effort is exciting and brand new will be in collaborative We'll be in collaboration with the student government and hope to begin this next year. Great, thank you, Alejandra. Um, I'll go next to uh, Sheila to talk about the Monsoon Asians and Pacific Islanders in Solidarity. Okay. Uh, Monsoon was formed in 2003 and it's a nonprofit organization that's main goal is to end all forms of gender-based violence. We do serve victims and survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, and human trafficking. We also have multiple services such as direct services and outreach programs such as the uh, campus program, which I am a part of. Um, although I am a freshman, I am just beginning to learn how to speak out and practice activism. And it's been a little difficult with the virtual climate with all the classes being online. But through Monsoon, I have been helping and improving lives of victims and teaching folks about racism, oppression, and sexual violence. Currently, the campus program around Iowa have been creating and planning events to virtually um, outreach and represent the student bodies and finding ways to assist the victims of gender-based violence. We also help destigmatize ideas in society today in the Asian and Pacific Islander community. Through the First Amendment, we use protections such as speech to speak up about ideas that have been stigmatized and then we use the freedom of assembly to hold community events to give knowledge to others about certain issues. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Ellie, we'll go to you to talk about um, what the graduate, I'm um, graduate and professional students and it does a lot of things, but in the in the context of activism, 
um, and campus climate. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So in the context of activism and campus climate, we do a lot in the legislature. So we are looped into what's happening in the Iowa House and the Iowa Senate. So if a bill is important that impacts our graduate students, we know about it. We try to speak out against it. We try to make people aware of or speak out in favor or against it, obviously. And um, we try to make people aware of what's happening in the state. We are a public land grant institution. So what happens in the political sphere of Iowa impacts us greatly. So we try to keep an eye on that to the extent that we can. Um, we are involved in talks with senior level administrators on a recent time, on um, a regular basis. So we meet with the president, the provost, student affairs to try to keep our finger on what's happening at the administrative level and try to provide feedback about how students are feeling or how decisions might impact students um, in that regard. I know we can be doing more. Um, as an executive council, we have issued uh, Led, we've issued executive memos speaking out for the Black Lives Matter movement, speaking out against Asian hate and um, crimes that have been committed against Black and Asian citizens and visiting scholars here in the United States and try to speak out to support the communities and have those voices heard. Um, it's difficult being elective, elected representatives, so we sometimes, you know, the GPSS as a whole can't always produce a cohesive statement in favor or against something because we're representing students that often share very different beliefs than the executives hold. But as, a, but as an executive council, we are able using the First Amendment to create these memos and disseminate our ideas as student leaders. Great, thank you, Ellie. Um, and I wanna kind of talk more generally too, we've talked about some of the specific organizations involved, but how can other students, um, faculty and staff as well, uh, use their First Amendment guarantees to improve campus climate and whether that be work with your organization or um, other things that you've seen done or you've been involved in on campus. Um, and Imran, I'm going to start with you because um, you've had both the experience of being part of International Students Council and um, some other organizations and obviously we invited you here because you're still involved but in different ways. All right, thank you for that. Um, I guess um, Throughout my experience, I think, uh, regard, in regards to the issue that is going on on campus, I would say that I can see that the, the university really um, cares about the First Amendment and they really want to uphold the First Amendment rights. So I think this question should be asked to the administration first. And I think that is why I think I, uh, I would call for the administration if they really seems to really care about the First Amendment, they should put it at front and center of their university. Like they should put it on their website, they should put it on the billboards. Um, put guidelines, I think, of what students can do um, before, um, let's say, if you want to protest on, on to an event, um, put guidelines of what you can do before and during the event as well. And I did some research about this, and I think um, I found um, one of the universities um, in the US, I think, Cal State Long Beach. I'll, I'll send it on the chat after this. But um, that this university provides a very interactive website in which students can see a guideline and what we can and cannot do under the First Amendment and what, uh, I guess, um, the things that we can do uh, by following the First Amendment, right? Because I think I saw that, um, I think Iowa State also has these guidelines, but I think it's just copy pasted from somewhere else, from some university, I think, and they, they just posted it on the, uh, the, yeah, on like a PDF file thing. They just put, posted it on the student, Student services, I think, something like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the question starts from the um, the administration itself first. So, this um, I would call for the administration to discuss about that and provide guidelines. Don't make it a law because I I don't think like that would infringe the First Amendment rights. So, uh, but yeah, build guidelines. And then I think for faculty, um, I think for um, Kelly, I think I I read your open letter towards the administration. Um, I really appreciate the things that you said towards the administration. Um, I think one of the things that I would disagree with is that um, the idea of making more classes or courses for students to take in terms of understanding about racism and whatnot. Because I think this idea about racism, um, if we try to solve it by in terms of taking more classes or courses, right, it just encircles the idea of racism into academia. And it, it lessens, it, it lessens uh, I guess, the idea of the racism is something that is structural, something that is institutional, right? So we should operate beyond what is going on in classes. 
And I think that is where we can move on to what student organizations can do. And I think um, even though I, I have some experience in um, being in different student organizations, and I can see that, yes, we have some things that we are, we want to do as a student organization. Um, we have our own interests, but I can see that we don't really have some sort of solidarity or also um, working together with other student organizations to work together to understand about the issue that is going on on campus and also in the country overall, right? Because what is going on right now is something that is very sensitive towards um, the community. And that is why I think for international student organizations, we just stay within our circle. So we just do the things that we do, um, make events, and then that's it, change of administration, right? Change of executives. So I think that is where I think student organizations, student organizations should step up work together with these um, different organizations to, uh, to build solidarity and also build consciousness between the members in the organization as well, right? We shouldn't rely on certain people and student organizations to understand about what's going on. Everyone in the student organization, everyone in the student organization should know about what's going on. And everyone should have the understanding to support and also um, mobilize in terms of, you know, doing protesting and doing the things that we can do under the First Amendment rights. Yeah, so that's my opinion on that. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that um, I really like um, some of what you said, both about, I, I agree, the far beyond the classroom is where these conversations need to be. And I think that one of the things I'm taking out of what you said that hopefully we can maybe run beyond this panel with is this idea of connecting different organizations um, to work together because there are a lot of common goals um, and, and issues, you know, there's, there's uniqueness, but there's a lot of opportunity to work together um, that, that might be more effective than all than groups acting independently. Uh, so thank you, Mia, I'm gonna jump over to you to ask, what do you think um, there are things that students, faculty, staff can do um, to improve campus climate? I think this is a great question because it's so relevant with all the things that have been happening on campus, not just this year, but in the past as well. Um, personally, I think that something that administration can do um, is be more um, vocal in where they stand with the situations that happen within student organizations um, and all the things that happen. Um, and some, some examples of that would be the mass email that was sent out a few weeks ago um, with that was very harmful and insensitive to uh, many uh, students of color on this campus. Um, and that is something I think that um, administration could definitely voice their um, stance on and distance themselves from um, very insensitive things that um, are very hurtful and harmful to the students that um, are paying to be here and to um, be a part of this campus. Um, I think that by not saying something um, about issues like that can be seen as complacency and um, can, again, just be um, add on to the fuel that um, campus or that Iowa State doesn't care about um, students of color. Um, and I think, and I'm sure that's not the case, but um, by not doing something, it's, it just, it doesn't show the support that we want as students of color. Um, and I think that with students, I think um, just cultivating uh, an environment on campus that continues to amplify the voices um, of students of color is so critical and important. Um, I think the Iowa State Daily does a very diligent job of um, writing about issues around campus and especially with like the student government um, elections that happen and all of the things that um, student government handles. Um, they do a great job of writing about that. But at the same time, I think that um, allowing students, um, multicultural students and international students to um, have a voice within the Iowa State Daily is um, much needed. I think that um, obviously we, Iowa State is a um, PWI institution, predominantly white in institution. Um, so it can be difficult in allowing um, students of color to have that voice um, because of obviously the vast difference of um, demographic. But at the same time, I think that not having a white 
white narrative on these multicultural experiences and perspectives that they have on campus um, is really important and letting them speak about their experiences um, without having it be channeled through a white um, perspective or narrative, I think is something that Iowa State can work on for sure. Yeah, thank you, Mia. I, I, I especially like the idea of having, of hearing voices and hearing from the people who are speaking, not, not filtered. I think that's an important part and hopefully um, something we're gonna, we'll get a little of this panel and think about ways that we could do that better. Um, so since you brought up the daily, I'll go ahead and shift over to Logan um, to ask, you know, what can, what do you think students, faculty, staff can do? Yeah, so uh, thanks for the great segue, Mia. Um, but yeah, um, definitely because um, I don't want to make excuses or anything or find reasons, but yeah, we are at a PWI and our, um, the makeup of our newsroom is definitely majority white. And that is an issue because when we talk about race and we when we talk about diversity, e equity and inclusion, it's white people write it. And that's not always the best when it comes to um, the issues because we don't live those experiences. We don't know those experiences. The best we can do is find people to speak to us um, and share their, ex their experiences so we can put it out there, but that's not always the best thing either because everyone's experience is differently and not one person can represent one group or community. Um, but um, one thing I do really um, want to put out there is that we um, would love anyone to come write for us. Um, any person from any um, college on campus can, you don't have to be journalism, you don't have to be English, you can be from any group, any college, anything, and come write for us. Um, if you want to do news, you can do news. If you want to write opinion, you can do that. If you want to take photos, you can do any of that. The Daily is totally open to anyone coming and doing things with us. Um, another thing, if you don't want to write directly with us, if you don't want to do things with us, we have um, a thing called Letters to the Editor. So if you want to write something about um, an event we had recently, a couple of students wrote about the email, Mia, that you were discussing um, about the, uh, the, fabric, the 3D printed guns. A couple people wrote a letter to us and we published it. So doing things like that, anyone can do that as well. And um, as long as it meets, you know, it's not hate speech in and of itself, we will publish it and create that um, communication and campus dialogue that um, we strive for. And I think that's something that I would really love people to um, engage in more is write us letters, write us guest columns, um, come in and talk to us, write us, send us emails and about an issue that you find on campus and um, we'll write about it. Just we're here as a voice, as a way to uplift the voices of um, our campus and Ames community and um, just send us story ideas. Um, any of the groups here, if you have events or anything, you know, send us story ideas and if we can get it covered, it gets covered and facilitating those conversations. I think that's really important and what the daily can serve as for the community, you know, whether it's faculty, staff or students, you can send us opinion pieces. We, it doesn't matter. You don't just have to be students to engage with us. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's something I think that's what I wanted to hit on. Um, yeah, I hope that did, did good. <laughs> now, Logan, thank you. I think that, you know, you make a good point. And I, I know that I interact with students sometimes who don't realize that you don't have to be a journalism major um, to go write for the daily, work at the daily. Um, and I think that's an opportunity that there are a lot of students, whether you want to work for the daily or, like you said, do a letter to the editor. Um, and, you know, one thing, Logan, you can take back to the other daily folks is, I was, as we were, as you were talking, I was thinking about how um, we usually have some daily representatives come into a lot of the Greenlee classes to recruit writers that maybe some outreach to some different student organizations um, could be a good way to, to build that connection a little stronger too. Uh, so thank you. Um, Drew, how about you? What are some other ways that students or faculty and staff could the, um, um, work to improve climate? That it's okay. It's about, it's first Okay, so okay, <laughs> um, yeah, um, I'll start with the most broad lens. I think when initially we were talking about the First Amendment, it was clear that there is a lot of gray area. I think one specific uh, sort of just a uh, way in which it is 
gray for me is that it also operates in the negative. And what I mean is that silence also speaks. Um, and so I think it's significant to remember that the administration only reacts when there are students and when there is a media institution that is pointing out these instances uh, that would otherwise remain buried. So I, I want to start off by saying that that um, is in a way what we're trying to avoid here is, is how do we make sure that there is no, no silence on this issue. Um, and then I think the first way to answer that question is yes, there is the, the, the reason that there has continued to be the silence is because uh, institutions outlive people. And uh, we have these um, changes in the executive body, uh, different um, social networks changing. And then as a result of that, the, 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 the movement loses, loses steam. So what I'm trying to say is that there are, other there are other institutions at Iowa State that need to step up. And I think that um, we are a part of that, in that um, process of allowing those organizations to step up. And so having these discussions is sort of part and parcel of what, what we need to be seeing more, which is that you know, organizations such as that are represented here today that will continue to be present at Iowa State will be the, the vehicle through which we can continue to organize in a cohesive way over multi uh, generations. And so um, I think that I interpreted this question uh, with more of a media critique kind of lens. And so I'll just uh, go on to make certain points. So I think that um, the, the main thing I'm trying to say is basically that racial justice is not gonna go away, I think. Uh, even if student activists aren't um, doing the work that they're doing, uh, it'll continue to be a part of the national media cycle. And so I think that um, when, um, you know, the daily is looking for people to talk to, uh, that is a, a sort of reactive approach. And I would prefer that the work be done now where a network of people is already being approached on and like, you know, is you're, you're building that network so that when um, there is a need to talk about certain thing, then you know who to approach. So uh, I think active, as activists and as people of color, we are always doing that, right? Uh, we're building that network because we know that, you know, sooner or later, or like sometimes it doesn't happen, but if you're putting yourself in positions where, um, you know, you're out there, then uh, you might be target of hate speech. And so, you, we, we have like those networks. And so we're putting in that work ahead of time. And I think that you can take a page from that and, and apply that to like having more, more of a representative uh, people or network to speak to when, when incidents uh, that require that lens occur. Um, yeah, I, I think that was in general what I wanted to say about what, what can be done better. Um, and I think that that applies to uh, faculty teaching courses and um, and everybody. Yeah, thank you, Drew. I think it's some great points there. Um, uh, you know, building those connections and knowing who to talk to and having kind of the um, long-standing kind of institutional memory is a challenge for student organizations, like several people have mentioned, with turnover. Um, but the more that we can build that in, the better, uh, I think the, the more sustained we can make, more sustainable change as possible. Um, so Sheila, I'll turn to you. What are, what are some of your thoughts on how um, students or faculty and staff can be involved in improving campus climate? Well, I also agree with getting started with administration first, because I know a few months ago, there was a email that was sent out involving how there was a racist act that involved on camp that was involved on campus, but that was the only thing that we heard from administration, I would say. And I feel like they could have done a lot more rather than just send out an email and not say anything else because that was like a one time thing. And then I think it was last week or maybe two weeks ago, there was a newspaper out on um, the racist acts that was commit in UDCC. And there was only one email that was sent out. There was nothing else involving that topic. So I feel like 
I agree. We could get started with administration. They could do a lot more. And that goes the same with like other students and faculties and staff because they are seeing all of these acts, but they're most of them are staying quiet. No one's really speaking up about it. And I feel like with the First Amendment, we should use the speech that we have and speak up against the violence towards vulnerable members of our society. And instead of like saying quiet, you know, they can use our powers to speak up. And since faculty members and staff and students, they they all make a big influence. They should use our voices and amplify the voices that are unable to and that are marginalized. And I also believe that we should all be like in solidarity and like, like you guys said, um, multiple organizations coming together and uh, be in solidarity. And because like one person might not have enough to like make an impact and they may have pushback, but as like a whole community, more people would listen and it would help. Yeah, Sheila, thank you. Um, I, I think some great points there um, and that kind of actually tie together what others have said quite well uh, in terms of, of working together um, and the idea that silence is itself kind of a statement um, or a lack of speech is, is itself problematic. Um, and we all like to see people from a variety of places on campus um, uh, be more vocal with some of these things. So we've kind of hinted at some of this um, and referenced a few things in our conversation so far. Um, but I wanna dive into what we're, we'll call hate speech or threatening speech. Um, as you know, we've talked about the First Amendment does protect speech from government censorship or punishment, including um, Iowa State University, um, as long as it doesn't violate other, other laws for the most part. Um, and, but we've had several examples of, of speech on campus um, that was hateful, that was threatening. How has that speech um, affected you or the people in your organization? And I'll, I don't want to call anybody out on this specifically, but if you want to just raise your hand and then we can, you know, let people chime in who, um, who want to share something with that. Let's start with Alejandra and then we'll go over to Imran. Imran. Okay, um, so I mean, it's pretty clear that, you know, hate speech affects everyone. Um, it's obviously affects people in marginalized communities. I've been affected by it. my organization has been affected by it. But in general, it's just, even if it doesn't violate laws, words are extremely damaging. Um, and, you know, to students of these marginalized groups specifically, they feel attacked. Um, verbally is, you know, usually about the same as physically. Um, it really creates a sense of uneasiness on campus and they don't feel as safe as they could be. Um, many students, you know, who hear these phrases are just traumatized, frankly, of like, will it be me next, you know? Um, I know my organization has tried to combat this as much as possible, but for, as students, it's harder to do so, and it really needs to come from a higher up place. I, I, I want to kind of highlight something you said there too, Alejandro, that I think is important. Um, you know, I, I hear some people say things like, oh, well, it's, it's, you know, hurt feelings, right? But it's not just hurt feelings. It's about feeling physically safe on campus. Um, and, and the ability to be part of the campus community. So, um, Imran, why don't you tell us a little bit of your thoughts on this one? Right, so I guess I can tell you about my experience of um, uh, seeing racism acts uh, or hate speech acts, I would say, um, throughout campus. And I think this is during the, um, the chalking incident in which I think that's the first time I saw what Drove is doing and Students Against Racism is doing. And I really appreciate what you guys are doing um, at that time. So I think I, I remember this uh, experience very vividly. And this was the time when I was walking to Gilman Hall by the library, right? And between the Gilman Hall and the library, um, there's a bus stop there. And behind the bus stop, there is a lamp poster, right? And I was, when I was walking to Gilman Hall, um, I saw that there's a huge sticker posted on that lamp post, right? And I was, um, I was very curious to see because it's very, um, it was it was a bit away from the walkway, but you can still see it from far. And when I looked there um, at that sticker, it says it doesn't has a word. It has numbers, and it says thirteen fifty, right? 
and as, and as an international student, I, I was pretty confused, right? I don't know what it is um, at that time. Uh, and so I, I became more curious and then I went to the internet and searched, what is this? Like, what is this number? Is it a fact? Is it a statistic? And the first result that came out on the internet is, you know, is by the Anti-Defamation League, like the ADL. And it says that the, the, the statistic is not only fake, but it's also a racist dog result. And so um, I, I cannot imagine the people who are targeted by that, um, the, the, the statistic, because I, I know for a fact that this, this, is, this doesn't target towards me personally, because I know that statistic is towards black people, but uh, again, it is a very, very um, disturbing statistic, a disturbing, uh, I guess, hate speech, I would say, um, in, in a way. Um, and that's why I think I'm um, going back to um, building consciousness and solidarity. That's why um, as international students, we also need to understand what do these stuffs mean, right? It's not just about, um, you know, the swastikas or um, the white supremacist um, logos that are, going, that are being posted on campus. It's also these racist dog whistles that are being posted under the guise of free speech. And so uh, in terms of organization as well, um, I think with the recent Asian hate crime, right? Since I'm also Asian, I'm Southeast Asian. And uh, uh, when it comes to the, the recent um, Asian attacks, the student organizations um, stay away from this issue, right? Again, we just do our events, we just do um, meetings, and then we change administration, right? And uh, that is why uh, I think uh, at some point we need help, I guess. We need help by the people who are um, for, who, the people who are in front of um, fighting racism in campus for such a long time ago, you know, like Student Against Racism. And also I think Black Student Alliance, um, they're pretty great um, student organizations that have fought against racism in campus for such a while now. And I think we definitely need to learn from them as well. Um, and also, I think also uh, in terms of students as well, right? International students. Um, you know, Logan, I read about your Iowa State daily, uh, Iowa State, uh, your newspaper article about the, you know, the price of free speech is four thousand dollars, right? I think four thousand is your, I guess, tuition fees. I would say, yeah. So as an international student, right? For me, I had to pay fifteen thousand six hundred dollars for this semester, right? Fifteen thousand six hundred dollars, and that's for business, right? But for engineering, I think it would has to be at least a thousand dollars more. So the incredible burden that has been placed upon international students right now to get good grades, um, um, satisfy your parents or your sponsors and go home, take, get a job. That is why it makes us become more stayed away from this issue that is going on. And that's why I think, um, I, I wouldn't really say that we need help, but also we need understanding towards each other so that we can build consciousness towards ourselves so that, you know, um, it's not just me who are talking about this issue. It's also almost every international students that are not in organizations right now. Yeah. Yeah, Drew, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I would I would like to echo what was said and say that like it it causes this feeling of like not being in control. Um, which is really unnerving and you're not in control of when it occurs to you, how it occurs to you, whether you understand it at first, how long it takes you to process it, but it is also a lack of control of what comes next from the administration. And, um, and I think that like, I, I wanted to make another point, which is that the question's premise is that hate speech is protected under the First Amendment. I would still encourage people to, to uh, protest that and to uh, continue to uh, bring that to the attention of the media, to the attention of people. Let's not normalize it. And also let's remember that some, only some of these cases are protected uh, by the First Amendment, not all. So this is a second. Um, so there are, there are many cases that we have seen in the last two years where people have uh, done something and seen repercussions as a result of it even if they were trying to use the First Amendment to say that what they were doing was protected speech. So, um, and, 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 with, and I think that going back to the first point about feeling like a lack of control, I feel like there is a lack of control up until the point when uh, the incident occurs to you that is outside of, or, or it's, it's harder to control. 
But I think what the administration does is easier to control because the, the, the purpose of the council would be uh, to sort of help navigate people through this labyrinth of different departments that you need to understand and to realize that sometimes, you know, communication takes months, not days. Um, and so just to help people navigate that system is what I was talking about when I said harm reduction. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, um, any other comments on this particular question? And I can make it a little bit broader. The last question I was gonna ask, which is related to this, and when we've talked some about um, is given both that the university is bound by the First Amendment, um, but knowing that there is some gray area as well, right? And we could, there's lots of debates about what are, should, should or should not be protected. Um, but what would you like to see the institution do in response to um, speech that, um, that is hateful, that is threatening, that does harm? Um, and Drew's talked a little bit about this with um, with establishing this council to navigate that, but I'd like to hear from some of the others as well. What would you like to see happen in, in your ideal world? Mia? Um, I kind of touched on this earlier with a previous question, um, but I think for me personally, I would like to see administration just validating your experiences as marginalized people on this in this campus. Um, Again, going back to that mass email that was sent out about 3D printed firearms, um, the only, I guess, statement that I saw, Iowa State release um, as an institution was that the email that was sent out um, abided the, the guidelines that Iowa State has. And um, nowhere in that statement, I thought that they acknowledged the fact that it was insensitive to communities. And that is really harmful um, and harmful and damaging to students and their experiences as an Iowa State Cyclone, um, because that doesn't validate what they had experienced. It does, and I think it's so important to just recognize that um, people are experiencing these things on campus and obviously making the change to make sure that they don't experience that again is a much difficult, complex issue. Um, whereas like with this first amendment, um, right, that we have, I think just speaking up about it and saying that I see you, I understand what you went through and um, making sure that they communicate to the students that are on this campus that um, they, they understand that and validate um, all of the things that they experience. And I'm kind of being repetitive at this point, but um, just making sure that they communicate and acknowledge um, what students face is something that I would definitely like to see Iowa State as an administrative entity do more in the future. Thank you, Mia. Yeah, Sheila, go ahead. I also feel, I do agree with Mia, I also feel like the administrative is not doing much because I know a bunch of students have sent in emails regarding like the mass email regarding the uh, 3D printing of the gun and they would just like dismiss it. They wouldn't really talk about it, which I found really weird for a university to like not really care towards what students are saying. And I would, I would also hear that other students would send in emails regarding certain injustices that would happen on campus and they would just dismiss it they would just be like oh just contact the support like one of the support groups on campus and that's it they wouldn't do anything about it so yeah administration is what we need to target all right yeah drew did you have something you wanted to add yeah i just wanted to add that the first amendment also pr like protects the university for making uh statements that heal in such instances and um, again, their choice not to use the First Amendment and instead like have this uh, neutral observer mentality is, is uh, or I wanna say neutral observer mentality is um, quite telling. So I think that it is one of the outstanding demands from Students Against Racism uh, that they, uh, instead of just sending out a email when a racist incident occurs, as is the current, uh, you know, way of operating. Maybe we need to look at what else we can do. So we've talked about training a little bit in this um, seminar or talk and discussion. 
Uh, I think that that training needs to be in spaces where racist incidents occur because clearly those are the places where people feel okay to be racist. Um, and so I think that uh, since it, then it also is occurring outside of the classroom. So there's also not that problem. Um, and so I think that, you know, we can ask the university to, to do more and like to be more proactive in, in using the first amendment to like provide like comfort and healing to the community, even if, you know, their hands are tied and they can't like do punishment for, or like prevention of, um, such instances. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Alejandra. I guess just to, to add one more thing, everything that's been said, I think I would definitely agree with, but um, we started this panel by saying the land grant university motto, which one of the aims is to be inclusive and, you know, being inclusive means protecting those students who are being attacked by or threatened by these hate crimes or words and everything like that. So it's, I would say it's part of the university's goal and duty to protect these students and the way to do it is by acknowledging what's happening and not going silent. This is something that's pretty easy to do and the university avoids it by, you know, saying that they want to remain neutral, but by remaining neutral, they are kind of excluding and not following their goals of inclusivity. Yeah, thank you, Alejandra. Um, I want to give it, we have just a few minutes left here, and I wanted to give some others a chance to ask questions or comments. Um, Dr. Michael Bujea wanted to make a comment, so I'll let him yeah. chime in here too. Um, I'm, uh, Diane is teaching right now, so you can see my picture is backlit, so I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to shut off my video. I just wanted to say, I'm a, um, a citizen of um, the United States and, and Malta and the European Union. And what really is uh, startling to me as a teacher, as a, a journalism teacher, is the First Amendment is absolutely powerful in this country. The, I, I mean, few people really understand that anything goes as long as it's not targeted at anybody. There are not a lot of gray areas, I'm, I'm sorry to say. I mean, President Trump uh, on January the 6th is probably gonna get off on the First Amendment. That's how powerful this is. However, I think that the university should celebrate and make climate the issue. I think we got a lot of work to do on climate at Iowa State University. And until we can really um, embrace equity, diversity, inclusion, equality, we're always gonna come down to hateful speech. I think the bigger issue is what is the university doing to enhance climate? And then are we using the first amendment to tout uh, uh, what we need? Or are we using the first amendment to assemble uh, at faculty senate? Are we using the First Amendment to um, take all these great organizations? And I want to thank everybody. I, I'm just, it just is so wonderful to hear your views, but maybe make a coalition where we can uh, have a website where we can uh, express our views. And perhaps, you know, the First Amendment, uh, Dr. Winfrey, protects anonymity. So I think that it's important if we have things to say, to have some sort of portal where we could use the First Amendment to say what needs to be done, and then maybe have the administration respond to some of those things. Just a few ideas, but I did want to mention to you, uh, please don't please don't think that the First Amendment can be overcome very easily. It can't. It's just as strong as the Second Amendment. Um, today, I'll give you a quick example. I have friends at the Times of Malta who took a picture of a uh, person under indictment for criminal activities who stuck his tongue out at the photographer, and then the magistrate went after the journalist for, for didn't go, it went after the journalist for um, putting him in a bad light. I, I'm just like, it's, it's amazing to me the freedom that we have, but with freedom comes responsibility. And I think that responsibility is on 
both the groups and the administration to find a portal to give voice, but mostly Dr. Winfrey, and I agree with you on this as my colleague 100%, we've got to improve climate. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Dr. Bujaya. I think, um, you know, as we wrap up here, it's one o'clock. Um, I, I hope that maybe the panelists here and I might reach out to all of you so we can maybe continue this conversation in a practical sense, because I think that one of the things that comes out of this um, that Dr. Bujaya was mentioning, and I think um, Imran started with was this kind of idea of, of coalition and working together across organizations. Um, I know that we have students who often feel that uh, you know the, that First Amendment protection, just because you can speak doesn't mean it's safe to. Uh, and so I think that, and my cats decided to join us too, <laughs> um, that if we could continue to work together um, and, and figure out ways that we can, uh, you know, I think when we say that there's gray area in the First Amendment, um, I think what we're all talking about really is there's gray area in terms of what the university can and can't do maybe. Um, and some of that might be validating experience and, and different ways of handling some of these situations. Um, so any final thoughts from anyone as we, as we say goodbye? Thank you all very much for taking the time um, to share your experiences and speak up and even more importantly for the work that you do on campus. Thank you for organizing, Kelly. Yeah, thank you, Drew. Drew was a big part of getting this organized too, since he's in touch with more folks. <laughs> all right. All right, thank you all. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.